Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. I know one thing. I'm really thankful to be up here right now. Not all of us would be thankful to be standing on stage. Um, some of us would probably rather die than do public speaking, which is a true statement. But I'm just really thankful that God has given me the opportunity to share some of his good news with you today. Um, so, I'll just be honest, this week I was not exactly sure what I wanted to say in my sermon today. And as I was going through this week, I was just kind of asking God, can you just give me some divine inspiration, whether my reading or, or whatnot, or someone that, that I'm speaking to this week that would just give me some kind of idea about what, what do you, Lord, what do you want your children to hear today? And so I started asking myself the question, if I wanted to hear a sermon around the time of Thanksgiving, what would I want that sermon to be about? How would I want that to be relevant to my life? And I was thinking about the topic of pain, because I think, ironically, pain and suffering is the common ground in which all of us, as different as we are, can connect. And it is actually through suffering that our God connects with us, which I thought was a really cool revelation. So I asked myself, how do I possibly give thanks to the Lord, as, as Paul says, you know, to give thanks in... I was thinking about, why did Paul say give thanks in all circumstances, in all things, at all times? How? You must have been crazy. Like, you, you were in prison, you were beat up, and you're still giving thanks? He's, he was probably either a lunatic or speaking a great truth. And so I was thinking, how do we manage to have gratitude in the pain? And I'd like to share a little bit um, about a little bit of the pain that, I, that I've gone through over the years. Uh, a couple of years ago, around the time of Christmas, actually, just a few days before Christmas, I had a friend of mine who was currently in, in prison at the time, and I got this bad news from a call from one of his cellmates, and he told me that my friend almost died because he was, he was getting involved in the wrong crowd, and he got stabbed three times in the back, and two of those puncture wounds uh, punctured his left lung, and his left lung collapsed. And he, he should have died, but, but he didn't. And so I remember two years ago, that was just a really, really dark time for me. I remember feeling cold, and how do I experience joy in this seemingly joyful time of, of thanksgiving and, and rejoicing the birth of our Christ, and yet this terrible thing happened to me, or affected me. And for a lot of us, or for some of us at least, the holidays can be a very painful time of family fights or painful things that happen during the, the season and so you don't want to remember that. You don't want to remember the pain. You don't want to experience that again. And then a year later after my friend got stabbed in prison, his best friend actually died. He, he, his best friend, which who I knew, finally succumbed to his drug overdose. And that was just a few weeks after his 21st birthday. And so I'm thinking, how do I give thanks? How do I have gratitude in the midst of this sometimes numbing pain? And, and, then, I, and then it just kind of brought me back. To, I, I guess it's, it's normal, it seems normal for us to, to lose family members. It's, it's okay to lose a grandparent because you're kind of expecting them to die. But to lose a friend who's your age, who's in their 20s, who's, or who was a teenager in high school and has their life ahead of them. How do you give thanks for a life that seemed to be randomly taken by God? How do you make sense of a God that allows so much pain and suffering in this world? I remember in 2009, just a couple of weeks after my high school graduation, she was only 16, she still had another year left, and my friend Nikki from band, we were band friends, both gang, band geeks and band, and a couple weeks after my graduation, I got a phone call, I was waiting to get a shot at Kaiser, and I got a phone call from a friend 
saying that Nikki just passed away last night. She was always overweight and had health issues ever since she was a little girl, and she finally succumbed to that due to a cardiac arrest at the age of 16. And thankfully she died in her sleep, but how do you give thanks to God in the midst of such unthinkable pain? Or, more simply put, where is God when we hurt? And thankfully, God gave me this divine revelation this week. As I was reading a chapter through one of the books that I need to read, um, so I'm taking this class called Experiencing the Trinity. And one of the reasons why I wanted to take this class is because I want to experience my triune God when it doesn't make sense to me. I want to experience joy when it doesn't make sense cognitively, when I'm physically hurting, when I'm emotionally distraught, I want to be able to experience him in the midst of all circumstances. And so I was reading this week, and this chapter, this book is called The Kingdom Life. And I found that in living the kingdom life, which is here and now, Jesus said, behold, the kingdom is in your presence. And his spirit is still living and breathing among us. And so part of living the kingdom life here and now is knowing how to give thanks to our God at all times because of who he is and giving, not giving thanks purely dependent on the circumstances. And so this chapter is called Formed Through Suffering. And in experiencing the Trinity, we're talking about spiritual transformation. We're always being transformed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And one of the, the huge ways that the Spirit forms us is through suffering. And so I, I wanted to just, I'll be referring a lot to this book and, and of course to the Bible as well uh, today, but I just wanted to share with you how this chapter, how God connects with us through suffering has affected my life this week and I wanted to share it with you today. And so, in Form Through Suffering, is, it talks about uh, so the author is a woman, Peggy Reynoso, and she talks that this is a, a sixth element in spiritual transformation. So spiritual formation occurs, she says, when God, in his grace, invades the destructiveness of suffering that results from the fall of man and uses the pain of suffering for his redemptive purposes in his people. There's also a unique suffering that shapes the formation of believers as they enter into the call to a love, a lost world, and the inevitable suffering that results from that love. And this particular element in this chapter really resonated with me because I never, it never made sense to me why I wanted to love of a friend who was a drug addict, a friend who was in prison. Why do I feel this innate desire to want to love someone that can't, to, to, doesn't really know how to receive the love? And so I found that we as believers, as Christ lovers, as Christ followers, we are called. It is a, a, a privilege to be called to love a lost world. But in loving a lost world, there is also inevitable suffering that results from that love. And so Peggy continues as a description for this. For the follower of Jesus, for us, no suffering is without meaning in our formation in Christ. All our suffering has meaning in Christ, and we can always find gratitude in that. All of humanity suffers as a result of the fall, but in the believer's journey of following Jesus, suffering takes on a formational meaning when God, in his grace, enters into the pain of suffering that is common to all men. Followers of, of Jesus Christ are called to a particular kind of suffering as they embrace and live out God's love in the world and experience the inevitable suffering that results from that love. This unique suffering opens the door to enter into the fellowship of Christ's sufferings and we fill up what is lacking in Christ's suffering. And she refers to Colossians 1 verse 24 1 verse 24, which says, sorry, 
Oh, I have it here. Now, Paul says, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. So he gave himself for us. He gave his life for his, his wife, the bride, which is us. And so I'm just going to focus on three particular points that this author makes in, in this chapter on how we are being formed through suffering and how we can find gratitude in there. And the three points are the fellowship of his sufferings. We, we experience fellowship together through our sufferings, and particularly God's sufferings. And the second point is the Trinity, God, of Father, Son, Spirit, suffers with us. God suffers with us. He is familiar with our suffering and afflictions. And then the third point is how our suffering is redeemed through Christ and how we see ourselves through God on the cross. And so our first point, uh, Peggy says that the fellowship of suffering joins those who share little less in common. Have you ever thought of you just walk into a room where you go to Alcoholics Anonymous or something and you don't know anyone there and you're thinking they're probably judging you. You're unconsciously judging them. They don't know the pain that I've gone through. They don't know all the crap that's been done to me. And yet when you hear another person's story, you see how their story somehow intersects with yours. Oh my gosh. I, I know what you're going through because I, I've been there. And it's amazing how the fellowship, the a fellowship happens when we are familiar with each other's sufferings, when, when we know each other's stories. And that's one of the reasons why, why I love being part of a small church because even though it can get a little messy and drama and, and knowing each other's stories, there's also a beauty in that because in knowing your suffering, I have compassion for you. And in being able to say, yeah, I know. Can you believe God says that too? God says, yeah, I know. I, I know what that feels like. And in that I know suffering, we can connect with him and have that common ground with him. And so the intimate knowledge of our own pain allows us to enter into the suffering of others and awakens us to the pain of God. Have you ever thought that God suffers all the time? Even though he is outside of time and space and is perfect and whole and complete in himself, he still chooses to step into our, world, our dimension of time and space and chooses to suffer and cry with us in this very moment. Or, or experience our joys in this very moment. This is a God who knows all of that. And so the intimate knowledge of our own pain allows us to enter into the sufferings of others and awakens us to the pain of God and the suffering of his son, Jesus. This is a measure of what it means to share the sufferings of Christ. And that's why Paul said it was uh, an honor to suffer, because I'm not just suffering for the sake of suffering, because there's no meaning in it, but it's an honor to suffer with Christ and have the sufferings of Christ, because we're not alone in all of this. That's basically what Paul was saying. We're, it may feel like you're alone, but the reality is you're not. And so in sharing the sufferings of Christ, we identify more fully with Christ's struggle and sacrifice because we know our own pain. We know our own pain. And he does too. And so as we identify more with his suffering, our gratitude, our thanksgiving for his sacrifice is deepened. Because we know that our God knows how we feel. And we can be thankful for that because he suffers with us. And then the author in the chapter also continues by kind of referring to 1 Thessalonians 5.18. There's a, a, a Thanksgiving card that I received recently, and it had this really neat saying on it, and it said, it's not happy people who are thankful, but it's thankful people who are happy. 
And 1 Thessalonians 5.18 kind of refers to that. And it says, Paul, Paul says, be joyful always. Kind of going back to be thankful in all circumstances. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will. This is the Father's will for you in Christ Jesus. And this is really cool because, um, so my, my book is, my book is, my, my Bible, I'm sorry, my Bible. I got my Bible as a gift for my 11th birthday. And I think it was like 2002, 2002. And it, it has, it's a, teen, it's a teen Bible, and so it has these little comments and um uh, paragraphs by teenagers at that time who shared there's a little bit of their story and how that refers to the pa a specific passage. And so for this specific passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 to 18, there's this boy named Chris, age 14 at the time, and he talks about life with Christ is a joy ride. It's, it's supposed to be a really joyful roller coaster, even though we don't really know all the twists and turns. And so Chris, at age 14 in 2002, he said, When bad things happen to me, my first reaction is not to be joyful. I don't feel like giving thanks when I'm hurt by a good friend, or, or when I fight with my parents, or get a bad grade on a test. I'm more likely to wonder, what is God doing? I feel like saying, okay, that's it. If God really loved me, then this wouldn't be happening. This would be this is probably this is a teenager talking about we're probably all asked that all the time when bad things happen to us, no matter how old we are. And then Chris continues on and he says, But then I look at all the ways God has blessed me. God gives me great, amazing gifts all the time. And I hardly ever remember to say thank you. If I paid more attention to praising God and less attention to my problems, I'd be a more much more joyful person. And so, I'm really glad I came across this, and I'm really glad that Chris shared this with, with the Bible publishers, because I can really connect with that, that our life was meant to be lived in full, and, and God wants us to live joyfully in, a, in an intimate relationship with Him. So the sufferings that we experience in this life, we can have gratitude because it draws us together, and most importantly, it draws us to Him. And then the second point that I found in this book was the Trinity suffers with us. And at first it refers to Isaiah 63, verses 7 to 9. And it says, I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord, as Father, Son, Spirit, has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for the house of Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses, in spite of all their suffering. He said, God said, surely they are my people, sons who will not be false to me, but true children. And so he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed. In all of their distress, God was distressed with them. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, God redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. And in this book, she refers to the message version, which, which I like, which says, in all their troubles, he, God, was troubled too. He didn't send someone else to help them, but God did it himself in person. Out of his own love and pity, God redeemed them. God rescued them and carried them along for a long, long time. I thought that was just a really great reminder how, in spite of it all, God's always there. I mean, Anthony mentioned in 2020, it's kind of easier to see God's hand, but it's so true. You don't have to always just look in 2020 hindsight to see that God's hand was there, but God's hand is here with you now, 
right now and always will be. And so though God is above time, our God fully enters into our pain in our moment in time and grieves with us. So yes, our God is the God who can say, yeah, I know, I felt that way too. Or just, me too. Have you ever just, you wanted someone to just listen to you and not try to fix your situation, but you want them to just have that empathy and compassion for you and say, yeah, I know. This God of love does that all the time. He says that. And so yes, this beautiful trinity of, as Father, Son, Spirit suffers with us. And then the third point that I found in this chapter, that our suffering is redeemed. The God of biblical revelation does not necessarily lift us, lift humanity above sorrow and tribulation. We, a lot of times we just want to have, like we have pain relievers, you know, we, we have addictions, we have, whether it's to drugs or, or watching more TV or keeping busy, keeping busy to not think about whatever pain or trouble that you're going through. But God doesn't give us a quick fix. He does not lift us out of our sorrow and tribulation, but he guides us. He guides humanity in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of the desert. And so, our suffering is not, is not for naught, but our suffering is actually redeemed. And we see that on the cross. Sometimes I think, especially as a woman, how Jesus can relate to me. How, how can Jesus, as a, who was physically a man, relate to the problems of being a woman in this world? And especially the, the sin that is done against women all over the world. How does Jesus relate to that? But on the cross you see that. He was stripped naked. He was taken advantage of. Against his will. Well, actually, it was really his father's will, so he was giving into the father's will. But still, his human side would have gone another way. He, that's why he needed the Lord to take that cup from him. But you see Jesus on the cross, and it is through the image of the cross that you really see how intimately God connects with our suffering and how he connects with every single form of unthinkable suffering that has happened in human history. And it is actually through that suffering that we can be grateful for that. Because God's strengths are made perfect in our weaknesses. And so the transforming power of the cross is replicated in our suffering, giving us hope that our inglorious, grinding pain will be transformed. He's constantly transforming us, constantly molding us, even though it hurts. You know, sometimes we need to go into the fire and get burned a little bit, but, but he knows the perfect masterpiece that's going to come out, out of that. And so he's... He's transforming us into something amazingly good, beyond what we can now see. So God redeems our hardships so that they have a salvific aspect, bringing good to us and to others. And in this chapter, she also refers to this quote by, by Jervis, and, and he says that the cross's presence at the center of his good news means that Paul does not shy away from either the existence or the experience of suffering. His good news does not necessarily promise its converts for transformation into superhumans. We, we we're not immune to the sufferings of this world, although it would be really cool to have superpowers. But we're not superhumans, and we're not capable of transcending or avoiding the troubles of human existence. But Really, our suffering calls us to share in God's work, share in his redeeming work. This good news is hard, but the hard news is also good. 
God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Pain is God's stage for, I like, I like the way it said stage, like kind of like, he sets the stage for us, and pain is the way that he sets the stage for displaying his glory. His glory in a fallen world, allowing us to experience, and others, to observe his power and goodness in our suffering. Suffering showcases the work of God in our lives, allowing God to reveal himself through weakness and great need. In the flesh, Christ assumes roles of weakness, and we're going into the, um, we're going into the Christmas season. We're used to kind of just seeing Christ as just a little baby in the major, but he's also this ascended conqueror at the same time. He's not, he didn't stay a baby in the major. He didn't stay in that form of weakness. But we see Christ, this, like God in the human form. We see Christ in forms of weakness as a baby in the manger, as a despised Galilean, a carpenter of humble station, a foot-washing servant. And through his weaknesses, he effectively revealed the divine power and character. And so as I close, I really like this quote that the author makes in this book, and, and she says, God uses adversity to shape our souls, and thus to spread the aroma of Christ. And so when we respond to him in the midst of our suffering, as desperate as we may be, we are giving him the response that he desires. Jesus tells us in John 10.10 10, that the thief comes only to steal and destroy. But I, God, have, has come. I have come that they may have life, that we may have life, and have it to the full. And, and so in living this kingdom life, we are to be grateful, not just because he, he blessed us with all of these material things, but because of who he is and of suffering with us. So let's live our lives in thanksgiving to our forever good, forever loving God, who continues to give us life abundantly, even in the midst of our sufferings in this life. Because he, God himself, as Father, Son, and Spirit, is our abundant life.